I was initially going to talk behind the podium, but I can't see over the podium. So I'm going to try to do all of this kind of off the, off the cuff. Um, we already had a great introduction, but again, I'm Kimberly Heafy. I'm the Deputy Director of the Yale Center for Health and Learning Games and Deputy Director of the Play to Prevent Lab at Yale. And I'm Sabrina Solba. I'm the Principal Designer at Shell Games. And we're going to share a little bit about pre-production frameworks and how we kind of stumbled into the fact that we need to really have one when you're working on these kinds of transformational educational games. And we're not going to dig too deeply into the exact frameworks. We're going to share some stories and kind of proselyze to you that you definitely should be uh, developing a process like this for your team. Right. And so how this started, how our, our relationship started. Um, in 2011, we, um, it was back in 2009, we received a large five-year grant at Yale to develop and evaluate a video game intervention focused on HIV prevention in um, young minority adolescents, 11, uh, ages 11 to 14. Uh, so 2011, after we'd done a lot of formative work, we partnered with uh, Shell Games and Digital Mill to uh, develop this intervention. Uh, and fast forward two years, 2013, this is the game. Um, this is, it was called Play Forward, Elm City Stories. Elm City is a spin, uh, you know, kind of a salute to uh, New Haven, Connecticut, which is known as the Elm City. So Elm City Stories. Uh, it's, in, it's a role-playing game. It's, uh, what happens is you start in seventh grade and you go through 12th grade and you're, you're confronted with a lot of di uh, difficult choices, um, risks, uh, just a lot of d decision making, and you have to see really like things that you do when you're in seventh grade, how they can affect you, you know, when you're when you're 20 and 30 and 40. So it's really about future orientation and um, risk reduction. And then at the bottom here, you see as you move through the stories, you go in and out of these mini games, which is where we say kind of where the where the, the magic's happening, where you're practicing skills and learning knowledge and how to use your knowledge. So that's the game we ended up with. But what's really interesting is not the game where we ended. It's that we had a big crash failure in the beginning when we first started out. Uh, we had some communication issues between our teams. I remember one story in particular that stands out to me is we were talking about the refusal skill minigame, which is a, a game in which we're asking players to rehearse and role play how to refuse their peers in a situation. And we talked about a game where you construct sentences and then you say them to the characters. Uh, and we made a prototype, the Shell Games team made a prototype that we thought was pretty much what we had talked about. And then we presented it to the Yale team, the reaction was, wait, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna get the change we need, that's not gonna be effective. And it was hard for us to see wait, what is different about what we talked about and what we were prototyping. And what we realized uh, was that our process had been this. We were both talking about the game design problem and there was a lot of conversation about the game design problem. But remember, Yale started in 2011, two years prior, and they had done a lot of thinking and a lot of discussion internally about the behavior change design problem. And whenever, whenever we were talking about the game design problem on the development team side, Yale was thinking about that, that all of their conversation and what they were thinking was informed by that. And the Shell Games team really didn't have that, that formative information. And so we reset our process, we kind of went back to the start, and, and what we did is we talked really deeply about this behavior change design problem. Everything that Yale had already figured out, <coughs> some baseline information uh, for our team, and then we started talking again about game design, but this time, both of us were coming together from the perspective of, okay, what is our behavior change design problem? What's important there? How does that inform our design? <laughs> Yeah, and, and we don't even have enough time now to talk about all the things that we learned and all the, the lessons we, we learned. And I always think that's what it got the most out of this project. The game is great, but it's these five years that we get to spend learning all these different strategies and processes. Um, so I'm going to talk to you just about a few kind of the those, those things that happened two years in um, where we did, we had to stop everything. Um, and, and what we did, we, yeah, we had to get in the same room. We had to share the work that we'd spent for the year and a half, the formative work, had to get, to get Shell Games on board with, with the research end, um, and then completely revamp our documentation process of what we were doing. Uh, so the first thing out, yeah, so what we did, <laughs> yeah, um, Shell, Shell Games team. came to Yale and we locked ourselves in a room for a few days and we really worked through all these pre-production problems that we were having. Um, because what you'll find is talking on the phone and phone conversations and passing documents back and forth, like here, you know, this is what we did for year one, this is, this is our model, this is, it doesn't work. So we had to get together in a room and really work through all of that. 
so we did that. Um, and then we explained the things to Shell that we, were, we had worked for a year and a half, two years on, a conceptual model. Um, this is one example, because uh, you know, handing this over, this is what we, what we need to happen from a, in a, a research side, right? This is a very common thing that, uh, as researchers, when we're developing interventions, we create. They're logic models or conceptual models. And what it does is it tells you, okay, this, is, this component of the intervention We'll, we'll do this, um, which will do this, which will do this, right? And, and it really kind of breaks down the intervention and lets you know exactly what's happening. And it's, it's heavily informed by um, the theory that you're interested in. In our case, it was like social cognitive theory, some health behavior theory, um, prospect theory. Um, and then it's also built on the existing literature and already what's out there. Um, so we had to sit down and really work through that together. Yeah, and from there, what we did is we really uh, changed and adapted our uh, documentation process. So we made documents, uh, just game design documents for each of the, mini the skill mini games, but we didn't start with the game design. First, we started with the design of the behavior change, which included how we wanted to transform our players specifically for that skill, and also the supporting research, uh, the theory of change. And then after that, we had the game design, and the game design had callbacks in our documentation to all those uh, starting research backing pieces. Yep. Uh, so what we're going to do is not spend so much time again on play for it. I think both of us have talked so much about this game. We're done, <laughs> right? But we've done some, we've all we've done some other exciting projects, and we've taken what we've learned and expanded on that in our own kind of in our own branches. And and we're going to give you some examples of of other projects we've done from what we've learned um, from this initial project. Um, and what I, I chose two games. One is um, Epic Heroes of Knowledge, um, developed by YogoMe. Um, uh, they're a, a math, um, well, an education games company, um, and we did, we evaluated one of their math games. Um, and then a card game, a, a social card game around HIV prevention in young black women. And the reason I chose these is one, it's an education game, which is not a behavior change game. So I want to so show how the processes can, can be translated there. And then a card game, which is not a video game, how we still were able to translate that. Um, so yeah, so another uh, really great partnership that we had this is back in 2015, we partnered with YogoMe, who's, who's a sponsor here and, and has a presence here at um, the, the Games for Change. Um, they came to us and they said, you know, they were really excited about the education space and really wanted to put some, some um, uh, research-based, you know, evidence-based games out there. So we're like, let's evaluate some of our, our you know, a, a math game that we've created. Um, and we're like, yeah, great, you know, that sounds awesome. Um, so the first thing we did is we, we spent some time really kind of breaking down the game. Um, and I can, and you know, it, what's nice is, you know, I, I'm able to kind of sometimes, yeah, I can put on my, my researcher hat, right, or my educator hat and say, well, I don't see a lot of, you know, um, feedback here. There's not, there's not a lot of um, um, player interaction. There's not a lot of narrative here. There's not a lot of um, problem solving, right? It's, it's a the great art, and it's it, it's a lot of fun, but it's really about rote memorization. And we, we know that, especially if it's a game built on common core principles, we really have to say that it's built in learning theory and it's built in common core principles. So we came back to Yogomi and we said, can we can we spend some time and work with you guys together and come up with a better you know a a, a, a better game? Um, and so we did. We spent six months, and it was the, it was such a great six months. We we. Um, came back with 20 mini games and they each focused on a common core principle and there were levels within those mini games. Again, it had learning theory, it was based in learning theory. It had those tutorials and feedback loop now um, to reinforce the concepts. It was theme based. They had some really amazing artwork and, and characters that we, we started to pull into the, to the mini games and there was more of a narrative and applied, um, applied learning. Um, we did the same processes that we did with Play4. We created that the, the game playbook, so everybody on the team is, knows exactly what what the, our goals are and where the curriculum is, and and again the, the theory, all of that was there. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, one thing that we did too, um, we didn't talk about this much with Play Forward, but we spent a lot of time with youth, right? Um, we with Play Forward, hundreds and hundreds of youth, um, and we did that again with Yogomi. So we actually brought these kids, the, the 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 game to first graders, right? Because um, kids are great about telling you what they like and don't like, and um, all that. They 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 were our, our our stakeholders, like the most important stakeholders. So we brought the game to them and um, interviewed them and talked to them, and they told us a lot, and we kept coming back um, until we. 
we got the game that we wanted. And here's a couple examples. You can see just the change from the, the early slides to here. Um, this is one of the concepts. This is, you obviously can't see the movement, but this is more uh, with the feedback loop than tutorials. So if a kid got the game, missed the problem, the game would show you the right way to do it, and then you try it again. So it, it would explain why you missed it and, and um, how to fix it. And again, had much more use of characters and kind of a story behind it, and it was, it was really lovely. Um, so those are examples of, of where, they, where we came from. Um, and then another thing that we learned along the process, we didn't talk about this, uh, was assessments, how important it is to match your assessments to what you're, what's in the game, right? You can't um, assess something that's not in the game. Um, and, you can't, and so your, your assessments have to kind of go both ways. Um, and this was just an example of how the assessments, we used this key math um, three assessments. Uh, they're, they're the kind of the gold star for assessments with Common Core um, math. Um, and you could see how our assessments would, would match perfectly with whatever was in within the game and the mini cons, the, the games. And here's our, if you want to read more about it, here's the article we just recently published on the findings. Um, and what we did find is that, yes, kids that played the, the, um, the Yogo Bee um, Epic Heroes, um, they, they did they did much better than the kids that played control games, right? Um, and the most exciting part was that kids that came in with really low um, first, first grade math skills, they, did the, they had the biggest, the largest gains, and they were the ones that benefited the most from um, the math games, which, which tells us you know, that kids should start playing math, or you know, get these games in kids' hands early, especially kids that are struggling with math. Um, so it, it, it was a really great project. Um, the second one, uh, this one's near and dear to my heart. This is One Night Stand. Um, it's, a, it's a fun, humorous card game that we actually uh, made. Uh, we got a, a funding from the Women's Health Research at Yale. Uh, we had 18 months to make a paper prototype, which is like everyone's dream, right? It's just a year and a half of, of, of going out and, 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 cre and creating a fun social card game around um, increasing, and it was really about empowering women to talk to their partners about using condoms and talk to their partners about getting tested for HIV and STIs, which are sometimes difficult conversations. So we wanted to make a fun game about it. Uh, so we spent, again, out of the 18 months, we spent most of the time doing a lot of formative work. We went out in the community, we talked to young black women, and um, we really wanted to know what they liked and didn't like in terms of games and, and platforms. And, um, and then we really wanted to know these things you know, about relationships and, and risk taking, sexual risk taking, partners, all of that, uh, really, you know, dating, all of that. We wanted to, to know as much as we could so we could make it inform, uh, to inform the game, the intervention. Um, so the idea of actually the game came from the conversations. We found that the women actually preferred card games over, the, the group that we had talked to preferred a card game over a uh, video game at the time. So we're like, let's make a, you know, let's really push this into a card game. Um, and then the idea of just kind of this matchmaking, trying, you know, Stan's trying to pick you up at a random place and you learn all this stuff about him and you have to decide whether or not to go home with Stan. And in the, you know, and in the meantime, you have to make sure you have condoms and you get tested and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Go ahead. It, and for, for this, even though it was a card game, right, we're still looking at it from an intervention standpoint, right? Because it is a card game, but it's still an intervention. So we had to look at it that way. We used the same, again, the same framework and ideas that we had used with Play Forward. Um, we created a game playbook, and, it, that, and we went through many, many, many iterations of that as the game would, would uh, evolve and change. Um, and then we, again, had a conceptual, a conceptual model for that. Um, and then we did a feasibility pilot study. So we actually took the game, actually after we created it, we took it out into the community. We, we, had, um, we had 21 young black women play the game for a couple weeks, um, and we had so much fun doing this. Um, and we did some, some pre-post assessment and a, like just one month follow-up. We really just wanted to get some feasibility data. And, and we were excited to see, oh, go back just one more. We were excited to see that the game um, it did uh, affect important mediators of, of behavior change, like attitudes and norms and self-efficacy and intentions. And even more exciting is people that played the game, their behaviors changed. So participants talked to their partners about getting tested. Four partners reported that their partners actually did go and get tested, and two reported that they got tested themselves, just from playing a card game for two weeks. So we were excited. We felt really good about it. Uh, so our, our next steps for this, um, we're going to move the prototype into a more polished 
finalized card game and try to get it out there um, to the people that can t benefit from using it. It's, it's a great way to talk about sex, right? Especially if, if for high school students or college students, and it just because, you know, it's a card game and, it, and it's fun. Um, we're hoping to look for funding to develop and evaluate a video ga game prototype of the, the intervention because video games, obviously, you can do different things than you can with, in terms of implementation and dissemination. Um, and then we want to modify the current game for other audiences, for younger or older audiences, for different audiences. Um, so yeah, that's one nice thing. <laughs> So on the so that's our, all the projects that Yale is working on uh, since or a couple of the projects that Yale's worked on since we did that play forward project together. On the shell game side, we're a studio that is really split between entertainment and transformational. And um, because we do both entertainment only and transformational games, that means at any moment we could be putting teams on a transformational game who may never who may never have worked on a transformational game before, even if they've been at our studio for years or they've been working on games for years. Uh, and uh, Play Forward, we really learned a lot. That was really one of our first big transformational projects. And uh, after we finished that project, um, oh, and one thing about Play Forward that was really important is obviously Yale came in with a lot of expertise about intervention and development. Uh, not all clients and partners come in with that level of expertise and self-awareness. In fact, many don't. Uh, so that combined with our need for internal training, we took that and, and started thinking about we need to be more intentional about what our process is for these games, these games that aren't entertainment only. And we looked at the other collaborative processes that were being used other places, Barbara Chamberlain's uh, Learning Games Lab, uh, a couple other places, and, and said we, we need to make a process here at our studio that's specific to our studio and our process. Uh, that we can use internally. Uh, so why did we invest in our own process? We needed this for institutional memory and internal training uh, for teams that were working on transformational games. We needed it to help our clients and partners get what they really needed out of the games that we were designing and developing for them. And we needed it because just the process of having our teams reflect back on what we had created or, or that, that framework process for us, that was going to help grow our capabilities and our expertise as a studio. So in 2012, we started formally developing an internal process that we now call the transformational framework. Uh, and the goal is to be very intentional about how we approach these projects. And I'm not going to dig into I'm not going to dig into every piece of the framework. But if you are interested, uh, I did do a Games for Change webinar about that in January. You can search the YouTube channel for that and take a look th at that. And if you haven't seen the Industry Circle uh, video series that Games for Change does, I definitely recommend checking that out. Just search for Games for G4C Shell Games. Uh, but I do want to share a couple of anecdotes from project directors who worked on transformational projects since we started creating this process and iterating on it. Because uh, I think it's great to hear from the people who are, are you know, doing the design on this project what they felt, what benefit they felt it brought to their, their project. And the first anecdote comes from Happy Adams. And unlike most of our transformational projects, this is not a client project. This was the brainchild of our CEO, Jesse Shell. So it's an internally driven project. And to quickly explain uh, what this project is. Build, scan, and discover the world of molecules with Happy Atoms, the revolutionary chemistry learning tool. The physical and digital chemistry modeling set lets you learn about atoms and molecules in an intuitive, hands-on way. The complete set contains 50 atom models representing 16 elements. The atoms connect easily with magnets to form molecules. Then, use the Happy Atoms app on your tablet or smartphone to scan your molecules. The state-of-the-art image recognition technology identifies the molecules that you build and provides detailed information about them. The free app invites you to explore the world of molecules in a fun and engaging way. Follow rookie chemists Harper and Andy on guided quests to discover new molecules and track your progress along the way. A 16-page quick start guide and experiment manual provides an overview of the app and hands-on experiments to get you started. These are the building blocks of the universe. Let's build it with Happy Atoms. Ages 10 and up. From Thames and Cosmos and Shell Games. So I asked Jotam Heimberg, who was the project director at our studio on that project, to share some of the ways he felt his team benefited from having uh, that transformational framework process. And his team really, they were one of the first teams at our studio to, to embrace this process. And we did a lot of iteration and a lot of learning as they were working in development. Uh, the first thing he, he mentioned was key concepts. Happy Atoms is a game about chemistry, about exploring atoms and molecules. But really, what aspects of atoms and molecules are they going to cover? Was the team going to cover? Because that could really be an infinite space. 
Um, what about reactions between molecules? What about subatomic particles or atomic forces? Uh, how you pronounce uh, the names of the molecules that you made? There's really all no end to topics. And this was an internal project, which meant Shell Games was the arbiter of what made it into this experience. There was nobody saying, here's you know one, two, three, four, this, is, this has to be in. Um, so we created a process to help us tackle this. We have teams think about their domain space as a map of interrelated concepts and to answer really two big questions. What are the key concepts, the ones that we want all players to interact with, uh, perhaps repeatedly? Um, and the reason why we ask that question, oops, sorry. The reason why we ask that question is because uh, we know that players aren't gonna all see every piece of content in the game. And we know that even players who do see content, they're not gonna engage or absorb everything. So these key concepts, these are the things we wanna hit multiple times. We wanna embody them in the game in multiple ways. These are gonna be the tent poles of how we think about design and the design mechanics and the content in our game. So the other thing we, we ask teams to really focus on is boundaries. Because we talk a lot about what's in the game, but what's really important is to talk about also what is out of the game. What are you not covering and why? Transformational games have a lot of stakeholders. Researchers, teachers, uh, experts, uh, parents, and everyone has their opinion about what needs to be in your topical game. Uh, and throughout feedback, throughout development, you're going to get feedback, uh, and you need to be able to handle that feedback. For the Happy Adams team, they use this vocabulary and process to make very intentional calls about what their game experience would cover. Uh, for example, they weren't going to cover things like subatomic particles, uh, particles or atomic forces. And then they use those decisions to parse feedback that came in from experts, reviewers, teachers, uh, and it gave them permission to say, yes, you're right, that is part of chemistry, that is part of information about atoms. We're not covering it, here's what we are covering and why. Uh, and it helped prevent them from hitting, getting scope creep or having a, a waffling back and forth of what were they gonna cover, what was gonna be important for the game. Another thing that we asked, uh, that we emphasize in our process is that player change is not monolithic. When you put a new team on a transformational game, they're gonna focus on typically knowledge and skill types of transformation. And uh, we know that people are more multifaceted than that and we can impact people in more ways than that. So what we found is that just, just putting this list in front of teams and partners jumpstarts a conversation about what are the different ways that we could and should transform our players uh, and helps us think in that sort of multifaceted approach. And again, we're using this framework, it's, it's a tool to jumpstart conversations, to guide early conversations, to make sure you're having those conversations early and you're making these decisions consciously and everyone's on the same page about those decisions. Uh, so uh, I talked to Yotam about this and he, he really said this was a strong influencer on Happy Adams team. Uh, again, their topic was chemistry and when you say you're making a chemistry game, there's a natural tendency to focus on a very wide array of facts you can teach about chemistry. And what Yotam said is this, we all knew information and knowledge were, were big parts of learning chemistry, but by thinking about the types of transformation, it gave me the vocabulary to talk about why it's also important for, uh, to have the emotional safety for learning something that is traditionally viewed as challenging and mystical and unknowable. And this really became the high level purpose of uh, Happy Atoms, to demystify chemistry. So it's not all about teaching chemistry facts, it's really about creating an emotional connection to that material. That's a different type of transformation. Uh, another game that I want to talk about is Night Shift. Uh, if you saw Jesse's talk earlier, he briefly talked about this. Um, this, this game, uh, our client was Dr. Mohan from the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And she came in with a very specific problem. Doctors in emergency rooms misdiagnose trauma patients. Patients who come in with trauma, they send them, they don't diagnose them as having trauma, and therefore they don't send them on to trauma centers, which uh, has a negative impact on their outcomes. And the reason why doctors sometimes don't do this uh, can be because of their own internal biases, right? The, the patient isn't presenting in a way um, that they expect for a patient who has trauma. So the goal of Night Shift, the high level purpose, was really to recalibrate the physician's internal heuristics when evaluating a, a trauma patient and to make better decisions. In this game, you play as a physician, it's a role-playing game, you play as a physician working at a small town hospital, and there are a series of cases that kind of go awry in the narrative, and the player gains experience with the contextual cues that distinguish patients with minor and severe injuries and they get, receive emotionally laden feedback in the context of the narrative about their performance uh, as a mystery unfolds in the story of the game. And really, the, go the goal is for players to, through the exposure of these medical cases used in the narrative gameplay, to retrain their perceptions about what a trauma patient is so that they make better decisions in the real life uh, when to treat a patient locally or to send them on to a trauma center. 
Uh, this is a game built to be the subject of research, and its audience is specifically practicing physicians. Uh, so this was a big thing that the project director for Night Shift, uh, Miha, uh, said that was a big deal for them when they were working on the early part of this project. One of the things that we emphasize um, in the transformational framework is how you approach your player audience. Uh, we go beyond uh, not just the demographic information, like gender, age, location, socioeconomic status, and not just uh, gameplay preferences, but we really want to dig into how the player comes to the game in con the context of the domain. What's their relationship the with the material? Uh, and we want to meet their expectations for what's authentic. And that was really important on Play Forward, to be very authentic to, uh, to speak to the audience. And that's also really important when you're making a game for physicians. And I think one place where it really shows in Night Shift um, is that uh, very early on they had these intentional discussions about well, how do we present the medical data, right? Because you can, when you see this, this is actually from the game, it looks sort of like gibberish if you're not a medical doctor. And the team was very aware of, if they were designing for a general audience, they'd make this much more usable, right? They'd make, they would definitely figure out how to present this very visual way. They would figure out how to, how to encode this information in a way to be very accessible. Um, but what they, what they did is they went directly to the doctors and, and play tested very early about this specific problem of, okay, well, here's the, here's the information we're gonna present. How, is it okay if we present it like this? And the doctors prefer it like this. This is close to what they're gonna get. Right, so that focus helped them, instead of designing a system to present this very nice in a very nice UI, they, um, they did what, what met the expectations of authenticity for their audience, and also met the audience where they were in the context of the subject matter. So moving forward at Shell Games, uh, we're continuing to iterate on our studio process, and we're also uh, looking to share uh, our process outside the studio, the Games for Change industry webinar, workshops, and books, uh, I'm working on um, a transformational framework book. I really think every team that's working on transformational games, educational games, gotta have a process like this. I, I just want everyone to, to uh, get that message from our, our talk today. Uh, and so the, I'm hoping that the transformational framework book, if you're interested in learning more about the shell games process or developing one of your own, that that will be a useful tool for you. And then also uh, Jesse Shell and Barbara Chamberlain are working on a book that's sort of a more expanded view of this space. <coughs> and covers more games in more detail, including through the design process. Uh, so look for that coming out, question mark, <laughs> soon though. Uh, and in summary, I uh, just wanna leave you with two big points. First, you should have a pre-production process, a pre-production framework process of your own. Don't leave your transformational design process uh, up to chance. It, it, especially developers who come from the entertainment space, they'll fall back to engagement and developing for engagement. Uh, so you have to be very intentional. Intuition and skill and expertise in game design for entertainment are really important, but especially for transformational games, having a very clear process that is a shared process amongst all your stakeholders, that's gonna help keep you on the mark of what it means to be successful, which is transforming your players. And then every game we make, um, you should reflect, or every game you make, you should reflect and iterate on your process. All games are different, so you don't apply the process. It's not ham-fisted, apply it the same way. You, again, it's about being intentional, being reflective, continuing to inform and grow your expertise for your team as you move from game to game. Yeah, and just to, to go off of that, that yeah. uh, like you said, there are, um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of really great work in this space. Yeah. So we've just provided two examples of kind of like our experiences and what we've done, but uh, there are a lot of people doing really great work. Um, in terms of these processes and to check them out as well. What may work for one group team may, may need to do something different for another team, so. Yeah, it's not, it's not so much it has to be do it this way or you're doing it wrong. It's more about just be intentional, make your choices consciously, have those conversations early uh, and, and um, dig into your design problem, which is that transformational problem. And that's, that's what we have. If yes, we have, you can find us. Maybe some time for questions, if anyone has any, or you can talk to us afterwards. Oh, yes. So yeah, in one of the earlier sessions, somebody was talking about the fact that if, if you wanted to make a transformational game, really only, you know, the figure she used was 25% of it should be transformational because the people who are using the game are gonna quickly see through your purpose. And it seemed that these games were like totally oriented towards the end result. Do you have any I, you know, comments on that or thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, 
from um, an, creating an inner, I still see this as an intervention, right? I don't think we could put Play For It on an app store and kids are going to choose that over Minecraft. They're not going to do it. They're Pro not going to choose it over. Probably wouldn't get approved either. It's it wouldn't get it, yeah. <laughs> deep subject matter. It is, it's true. But would you rather learn about um, alcohol, sex, and drugs, you know, 11, 12, 13, through a game, or would you rather have your teacher stand up and talk to you about it? Of course, you know, you should see that, I mean, they're like this, you know, as soon as they really dig into it. So I don't know if we're, we're not com competing. I think it's okay for it to be upfront at what it is. And kids are smart and they figure it out quick anyway. There's no reason to try to code it into something it's not. That's my, my feeling. It still needs to be fun and engaging. And I don't even know the word fun sometimes. It just needs to be engaging um, and, and to pull people in and connect. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's more than one approach. I think I yeah. think you can definitely have this sort of sneaky learning where it's all it's it's really you're you're trying to fool the player in some sense that can be compelling. I also think sometimes it's it's beneficial, and there is some research that if you invite the player into the learning process, if you if you're connecting to how they're what they're motivated about, how they're intrinsically motivated about the topic, um, that that can be beneficial. So I think that's kind of what Happy Adams tries to do is it's very much trying to get you into the material. Uh, I don't know how we would pretend that it's not about chemistry. It's <laughs> so it's so uh, front and center, and just try to make that learning process playful. Uh, and of course, night shift is very specifically tr uh, to be a training for sort for physicians. So those particular two examples, it is close to the surface. I do think there is another approach that's definitely valid, which is you're trying to change people, and you don't want them to know because you want to have their their shields need to be down, um, or you don't want to tap into those things that people sometimes say about educational things like it's yeah. not cool. Or especially for, for kids, people are sensitive to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.